Thank you. Beautiful, India. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Oh, it's a treat to see all of you here this morning, and, and I want to thank you for joining me in, in a morning of, of celebration of an amazing, amazing life, an, an amazing light in our world. And um, I want to share with you that um, as I was sitting here and listening to India sing, I really felt the presence of Wayne Dyer here. And I just feel that there's an energy within each and every one of us that that light has touched in some form and some way. How many of you here have in some way been touched by the life and the, and the teachings of Wayne Dyer? There's very few people who have not. And the reality is you probably have whether you know it or not because Wayne was a teacher of teachers. He was a teacher of many of our, our spiritual teachers and he was also one of the things that made Wayne, Dr. Wayne Dyer a great teacher was he was an amazing student. And he was always open to learning, always open to expanding his energy and his awareness and his consciousness in new ways and new understandings from different places and different ways. He was open to the great possibilities of life. And so uh, today I wanted to really take some time to, there's no way that I can really capture all that Wayne Dyer has brought into the world. But I wanted to share some, some thoughts and some ideas and some experiences that I've had from uh, experiencing Wayne Dyer's teachings and say a little bit more about him and, and his work and what he's been doing. But I always like to start off with a story, right? So I'm going to share with you a story that I came across when I was preparing and, and thinking about this. And there was an elderly man who was actually quite wealthy and, um, but became desperately ill. And knowing the time for his departure was near, he called f some of his closest friends, three of his closest friends, to come see him at the very last m minute and at the last times. And so they were attending him there, and there was a doctor, and there was a pastor, and there was a business manager. And he said to them, I know that you can't take it with you, but, you know, who knows for sure? And so uh, what, if, um, what if the experts are mistaken? Uh, so I want to um, account for all the possibilities. So I'm, I'm going to give each of you an envelope containing $100,000. And when I die, I want you to each to slip the envelope in my jacket pocket at the funeral service. And then if I do need some money in the life to come, I'll be ready. And then I'm giving the envelopes to you because you are my most trusted friends. And then shortly thereafter, he did pass away. And... Each of his three friends was seen slipping something into the, the, the de deceased man's coat pockets as he, as he walked up to the casket. And so, but following the service, while these friends were visiting themselves with each other, the doctor, with a sheepish look on his face, said, Guys, you know, I have a confession to make. You know, with the cost of medicine today, and I, I don't make that much money, and the hospital is desperate for funds, and we can't even replace the CAT scanner that that we really desperately need, and it broke down, and it would take $20,000 to replace it, so I have to confess that I, I, I took $20,000 for that new CAT scanner out of the money I, and put the rest of it in. And then the minister cleared his throat and kind of looked down in his shoes and said, I, I, I too have a confession to make. Uh, as you know, our church was really, you know, kind of overburdened with the needs of the, the homeless. And so um, I just couldn't see burying that money. And so I, I, I took 50000 out of the envelope and, and uh, put the rest in his pocket. And the businessman looked at him very sternly and says, I cannot believe what I'm hearing here. I cannot believe I put the whole $100,000 and I gave him a personal check. <laughs> Well, I don't know exactly what that reminded me of, other than the fact that I know that Wayne Dyer was a wealthy man. And what I mean by that is, he was wealthy certainly in terms of financial wealth, but he was wealthy because of the wealth of his willingness to be a person who gave forth the wisdom that came to him through his own spiritual practices, through his own life. And the wealth that came to him came as a result, not because of he was out looking for that, 
but it came to him because he was out looking for ways to give that. And he lived his life in a way that was giving of the awarenesses, the understanding, the experiences, and yes, the, the, the givingness of life that he really embodied in so many ways. I, he was just a phenomenal author. He, uh, I understand that he wrote 42 books in his life. He also made a movie. He's also been on television. He's been on Oprah Winfrey numerous times. He's been an inspiration for so many in life. And if you've not really taken the time to read some of his work and to listen to the wisdom that came through him, then you want to take some time to really reflect on. And I could spend years going and just using uh, the resources from Wayne Dyer, and you would, not, you would absolutely find that every, everything in our lessons here is something that he himself also had either learned and was teaching or some new awareness or way of saying what we're talking about here in unity. He had amazing insights and ways of very simply, succinctly putting some of these spiritual principles in our lives. He had 21 bestsellers. 21 bestsellers. That's, I think it's some kind of a record, actually. I don't know that, but I would be, wouldn't be surprised. He had 21 bestsellers. Everything from your erroneous zones. How many of you had a chance to read that back in the 70s? Your erroneous zones. Man, it's still a powerful work. And it's been translated in 47 different languages. Uh, it spent 64 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list because it is a work that absolutely transforms lives. And so if you want to really find something that's going to really shift your awareness and your energy, go all the way back to 1976, the erroneous, your erroneous zones. I remember one of my friends posted on Facebook recently. She said, I picked up the book because I thought it said your erogenous zones. <laughs> but <laughs> and so I picked it up, and I was a little disappointed when I found out it said your erroneous zones. But when I started reading it, I realized that this was the book that I really needed for my life. <laughs> and uh, it was absolutely a transformational work for my life as well. Another amazing work uh, that... Well, I just couldn't even begin to list all the 42 amazing books, but um, there's a spiritual solution for every problem. Fantastic, beautiful book. Even before that, one of the ones that really was very um, powerful for me was, um, I've gone blank now, I didn't have it in my notes, Magic. What was the name of that one? The, the, oh, it'll come to me anyway. There's one he wrote called Magic. I knew I would remember that, and so I didn't put it in my notes, right? <laughs> Fantastic book. Actually, I probably have it here. I've got about, I, I, oh, here it is, Real Magic. Real Magic. Powerful work on the law of attraction and how our, our creative minds draw into our experiences all of the things that we really need at any given particular point in time. Well, as I said, I've got, I mean, I've got, a, a number of his books right here, and I, I gave probably most of the ones that I read of him away. So if you want to know about some of my deep inspirations, you'll know that Wayne Dyer was definitely one of those. He started off actually as a psychologist and, and was really writing more from a psychological perspective and really talking about how uh, the, the workings of the mind and the things that seem to get in the way of our experiencing uh, good and experiencing our possibilities in life, and uh, he began to have um, he began to draw toward a more spiritual awareness and understanding. And as I was uh, looking at this and thinking about how Dr. Dyer began to make that transformation, he shared in an interview that I saw recently that one of his best friends was a, a, a a minister by the name of Jack Boland. Any of you familiar with Jack Boland? You've heard me mention Jack Boland a number of times because Jack Boland was a unity minister from Detroit, Michigan, Warren, Michigan, actually, uh, Unity Church of, of today at that time. Uh, and Jack was the kind of the developer of what m most of us know in unity as the mastermind process. You've heard of mastermind, I'm sure, and we've talked about mastermind, and we've taught mastermind, and on Wednesdays we do a mastermind process that was based on Jack Boland's work. 
And the mastermind process is a powerful transformative process that can heal and transform any aspect of your life. And what I found and discovered was that Dr. Wayne Dyer was a mastermind partner with Jack Bolin and that they had these wonderful influences on each other and they helped move each other into their possibilities in life. And that's one of the things that really uh, a great teaching is to really draw to you and be with people. Two things that I really gathered from Dr. Dyer. Surround yourself with people who are going to lift you up and also people who you can lift up. And if there are people around you who are not lifting you up, you need to bless them and release them on their way. And not in a negative way, but just know that there are those who are drawn into your life that you can make a difference with. And there are those that are not necessarily there and, and are not going to be there for you to lift you up. And therefore, don't be with those people who are going to draw you down. It's a powerful understanding. Well, I want to share with you some thoughts and insights as we go through today. As we celebrate this wonderful, powerful teacher, I had an opportunity to hear Wayne speak again. I heard him many years ago speak at Unity Village, actually. But I heard him speak again recently at an I Can Do It conference. And I had some powerful notes from that that really spoke to me. And he quoted this, I believe it was from Anais Nen. And the day came that the risk to remain tight in a bud became greater than the risk to blossom. I love that phrase. Let me read that again because it's just a powerful, succinct awareness when we think about it. And the day came that the risk to remain tight in a bud became greater than the risk to blossom. This is one of the things I think was a key awareness and a key teaching from Dr. Dyer is that there are things going on in us that are making us really uncomfortable, but we're used to them. And because we're used to them, we have a tendency to ignore them. And those things that are, uh, are uncomfortable will continue to grow within us until they become so uncomfortable that we take the, the opportunity to step beyond them. And this is really one of the key lessons of the, your erroneous zones, is that there is something within you that is being called forth that is greater than what you're consciously aware of at this time. And yet it's there knocking at the door, and it's knocking at the door through many of the things that are making you uncomfortable. Many of the things in our lives that make us uncomfortable are the very things that are calling us to step into a greater possibility of who and what we have come here to do and to be. I'm going to actually show you some, uh, one of the things that in, in making a tribute to Wayne, I put together a little presentation that really speaks to some of the heart of what he was trying to present. Could you, could I, would you hit an escape key there, Steve? Thank you. No, escape key. All right, then let me do this. One moment. All right, there we are. And where's my slideshow? From the beginning on the left, thank you. <clears throat> One of the quotes from Wayne that I came across that I, uh, really spoke to me some years ago that uh, because I was in a place of feeling really miserable was be miserable or motivate yourself. Whatever has to be done, it's always your choice. I didn't like hearing that at the time, I want you to know. <laughs> and I suspect many of us don't like hearing that when we're in that place of feeling miserable. But the reality is we always do have a choice of where we're going, the direction of our energy, the direction of our thoughts, the direction of our consciousness. And that's, that's the essence of what he was trying to show us is that we do have that power to shift and to move out of those spaces. And there are steps that we need to take in order to do that. But it, it's not something that we are that we are in any way helpless to, that we have within us the means to be able to make those shifts. Powerful understanding. This is another one that uh, really 
spoke to me, and, as, and I, I keep getting lessons in this over and over again. I don't know if you guys do, but um, he says, how people treat you is your karma. As their, excuse me, how, how people treat you is their karma. How you react is your karma. I had an experience uh, just a, not too long ago of someone in my life that, um, you know, they were saying some things that I didn't like very much. And they were saying them about me. And I had a choice to make. And I, I, at the time, I remember thinking, well, I'm just not going to have anything to do with this person anymore. And that was my uh, reaction. I was, really, I was really feeling very angry. And I, I stopped at that point, though, and realized that that wasn't the decision I wanted to make. Because I realized this very thing. That wasn't about me. What they were saying wasn't about me. It said nothing about me. It was really more about them. And what was there for me was my reaction. That the gift in that was my reaction. And it wasn't so much the reaction, it was my, my becoming aware of my reaction. And my reaction was to become angry, to become defensive, become resentful. Nobody here has done that, right? Yeah. But I did that. And I'm not going to it. And I, I looked at that and I realized that that was a conditioned response to someone who I felt I, felt I was being judged, I felt I was being criticized. How many of you here, and, I, and, and what came to me is, what really came to me was, I don't know how not to react with anger and frustration when I'm being judged and criticized. Now, when you, when you hear that, you may say, well, that's right. How could you not be angry and resentful and frustrated and when someone is judging and criticizing you? But I'm going to suggest to you that's the very lesson that was there for me to learn is how not to react with that same kind of energy, but to look at how I'm reacting and to be able to shift that consciousness and that energy. And as I began to do that work, as I began to say, look, I don't know how to react differently, but I'm willing to. How can I do this differently? How can I experience what they're saying and what's coming across and, and how they, they are in a different way? And the shift for me was, Stop, I stopped trying to make them stop judging me. Does that make sense? It wasn't that it, I was spent so much energy trying to get this other person to not judge or criticize me. And it occurred to me that was a waste of energy because that was what their job was. That's why I drew them into my experience. I drew them into my experience to be judged and criticized so I could learn how to react differently to judgment and criticism. Does that make sense? Now, that wasn't a fun lesson. I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't enjoy being judged and criticized. But the reality is, man, what a gift when I was able to say, oh, it's not about me trying to get them to not be judgmental and critical. It's about me learning how to respond from a different energy and a different place and be able to come from a place of, of awareness, of compassion, of understanding that I drew them into my experience for that very reason, I may not like it, but if I don't like it, it's not that I, I, it's not pushing it away. It's shifting my reaction to it. It's shifting and not reacting to it, but coming from a place of awareness and consciousness and compassion. It's a great, great lesson for me to learn. And, and I, I know that it's one of the things that this saying actually really helped me with. It wasn't my karma. It was theirs. Mine was how I reacted. In order for me to heal that experience in that situation, I needed to really look at and heal my karma around my reaction. Make sense? Boy, th this is a lesson we could do for a while, I know, because it is something that we have these triggered kind of responses that we've developed over our life. And part of our work is to learn to be free of those. I love this one also. You cannot be lonely if you like the person you're alone with. Let me say that again. You cannot be lonely if you like the person that you're alone with. You've heard it before. Love yourself. If you learn to love and like yourself, you will always have good company. Isn't that true? 
And the more we learn to accept ourselves and learn to be comfortable with our own company, what we find is that we draw to us people who are attracted to someone who likes their own company. <laughs> and so we will draw people who have a similar kind of awareness and energy. And it won't be that we're trying to get someone else to make us not lonely. Make sense? That we actually learn to appreciate our own self and our own being in such a way that our own company becomes valuable to us and that we really do want to be spend time with number one doesn't mean exclusively of course we do want to be out in the world but we learn to honor those times that we have with and for and to ourselves if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. I'm looking at this, uh, this older picture of Wayne, and, and uh, you know, Wayne made a few changes in his life, you know, physically as well, you know, and, and uh, he, I remember him making a comment about this picture, and he says, I wish he could go back and change that, but the reality is he loves it the way it was, and so, um, you know, he was one of us. He had long hair and was, uh, you know, <laughs> he, um, this one actually came off the book, Your Erroneous Zones. I remember that one very well. But the thing about it is, it's a simple understanding that we are actually affecting, not just affecting, but we are actually helping to shape and form what we are actually perceiving out there. And so if we want, if we want to experience something differently, the first thing is to begin to look at it differently. Begin to willingness to see it differently. To ask yourself, how can I see this differently? How can I look at this from a different perception? How can I look at this from a maybe a little higher perception and be open to seeing that, per, that person or that circumstance or that situation from a little higher place? When you judge another, you do not define them, you define yourself. Let's look at that. When you judge another, you do not define them, you define yourself. It gets back to the one we talked about earlier as far as the you know, uh, how they act is their karma. It, it occurs to me that when we are me being judgmental of another person, what we're really doing is allowing our judgments to come forth and show, and that's really saying a lot about who and what we are. It doesn't necessarily say anything about the other person. The reality is that we may judge another person, but what we're really judging is our perception. The reality is we never judge another person fully, truly, because when we are being judgmental, what we are really doing is judging our biases about something that the other person reminds us of. Make sense? And so part of our learning to shift our awareness is to recognize that when we are putting out energy that is somehow not in a loving space, we're saying volumes about ourselves but we're not saying anything about the other. Isn't that true? Yeah. And the, the reverse of this is really powerful to understand also. When, you, when I say it's not really the reverse, but the other side of it, when another is judging you, it's valuable to recognize that they really aren't. In fact, they really aren't. They really can't. When you're being judged by someone else, what really is going on is they're judging a, a decision they've made about you. They've, they are judging their own judgments, basically. They're judging their own perceptions. And their perceptions may or may not reflect reality. You get to decide what the reality is for you, that you, you know, certainly people can share with you and be a mirror to you in many ways, but they are actually judging their own perceptions. And so it's valuable to recognize as... It, as uh, uh, Don Miguel Ruiz says, it's never personal. It's not personal. It can't be. It's about what they're experiencing, and it's not really about you. That's reassuring, and it actually is a very transformative understanding and awareness. I like this one also. Love is the ability and willingness to allow those that you care for to be what they choose for themselves without any insistence that they satisfy you. There's a, the there's a clincher, isn't it, oftentimes? We oftentimes are in experiences and relationships because we think that it's about getting our needs met. 
You know, that, I've heard that a lot in different groups and, and different counseling work, as a matter of fact, that uh, you know, per, uh, you're in a relationship to, to meet, help meet the needs of the other person and also to get your needs met. I'm going to suggest to you that's not the truth. It really isn't coming from a place of love when that's what your relationship is really about. Now, that may be one of the perks, which is kind of nice. It's kind of nice to have that. But the moment that we depend upon our partner or another person or a child or a parent or someone else to help to, to meet our needs, we're no longer really tuning into the, the, the truth of who and what we are. And the reality is our needs come from within us, and they're met from with that energy of spirit that is within us. And someone in a, we're in relationship with may reflect that back to us at some point, which is wonderful. But if we're not in that energy, that awareness, that consciousness that it comes within us, and we're making them the object, then we actually are, are uh, uh, becoming codependent, you might say, with them, and they become the object of our, what makes us happy, and therefore we are dependent upon them to be a certain way in order for us to be fulfilled, and if we are doing that, we're basically making them our God, aren't we? Did you follow that little thread there? We're making someone else our God, and the truth is, the spirit of the divine is within each one of us, and we have working through us the possibilities of having every need met, and part of the reverse of this understanding is to recognize that and acknowledge that spirit within ourselves and recognize that that can show up in numerous different ways, and, it, and, and one of the ways it can show up is in our relationships with others when we're coming from that space. Oops. Let's go back here. And there. You cannot always control what goes on outside, but you can always control what goes on inside. We spend a lot of time and energy trying to control what goes on out there, don't we? And it's a waste of energy most of the time, maybe all the time. The real process, the real work, is really looking at what go, what's going on out here and what is my, what's, coming on, what's going on inside of me when I experience what's going on out here? And how can I shift what's going on inside of me about what's going on out here in such a way that I'm actually becoming an influencer and an energy and a, a, a vibration that is shifting the possibilities of what's going on out here? You follow that? So it's not trying to change what's going on out here. It's changing what's in here so that what goes on out here reflects more of what goes on in here. Helpful? All right, let's do another one. I love this. When you dance, your purpose is not to get to a certain place on the floor. It's to enjoy each step along the way. Julie and I had a wonderful time on our cruise. We got a chance to do some dancing a little bit while we were on our cruise. And um, uh, sometimes when we were on the cruise and the, and the boat's going like this, the object is just to stay up. But <laughs> we had the smoothest, one of the smoothest cruises we've ever had, actually. One of the cute, smoothest experiences of the water was very smooth. So we had a chance to do some dancing. We love to do Latin dancing. And, and, it, and, and this really wrote, spoke to me is that, you know, when we do get up to dance, it's not to get from point A to point B. It's to really enjoy each other's company and to be present to the dance and to experience it and to have fun with it. And I think that's true in life. I think that life is about not trying to get from point A to point B, but to really experience the fullness of life in each step that we take. And the more we can do that, the more we experience the power and the joy of living. And when you squeeze an orange, this is one of my favorite things. He did this when he spoke at the I, I Can Do It conference. He said, when you squeeze an orange, orange juice comes out because that's what's inside. And when you're squeezed by what comes, when you are squeezed, what comes out is what's inside. I was thinking about that earlier experience I mentioned to you. And I mentioned to you about feeling squeezed by this person by the, the words and the thoughts that were going on. And what, uh, 
what really was coming out of me at first was not necessarily, it was anger and resentment and frustration. And I realized that the only reason why that was coming out is because that's what I had in me. That I had this energy of anger, resentment, and frustration. But the reality is I had this energy of anger and resentment and frustration before this person ever showed up in my life. And I think that's something for all of us to begin to recognize that we have that energy, those kind of energies in us before the people that trigger them ever show up. And so rather than trying to make them responsible for the energy of anger, resentment, and frustration, we need to acknowledge that that's an energy pattern that we have. And maybe it's not, maybe for you it's not anger, and resentment, and frustration. Maybe it's sadness, despair, and depression. Maybe it's defensiveness, you know, you can pick your own combination. You, you, we all have our little ways of trying to deal with being squeezed, don't we? And most of those are what Moshe Rosenberg would call catastrophic strategies for getting our needs met. And so part of the waking up is to recognize that they're there in us, and our work is to, to begin to shift those energies and to begin to shift that, that response and the reaction in such a way that we're not just automatically triggered by those circumstances or situations, when we're not triggered by what others are saying or doing out here, but that we are able to come from a space of awareness and consciousness to be able to make conscious choices and decisions to express the, the essence of who and what we truly are, which Wayne Dyer very clearly says is love. That's the essence of one of his, of his, all of what he taught is that you are spirit. You are love. That's the truth of who you are. That's the truth of who all of, what, what all of us are. And all of these other things that we do are ways that we either are trying to get that or trying to, we need to learn to share that or give that in some way. He also was a wonderful prosperity teacher, and, and he says, abundance is not something we acquire, it is something that we tune into. It's something that we tune into. So I love the next one also. He says, uh, when I chased after money, I never had enough. When I got my life on purpose and focused on giving of myself and everything that arrived into my life, then I was prosperous. Just some of these phrases in themselves, if we just learn to recognize and hold on to some of these little simple phrases that he was able to coin, can make a difference in all of the ways that we experience life. And one of the greatest ones that he's known for is, you'll see it when you believe it. You'll see it when you believe it. He wrote a whole book about this, but that phrase has really changed a lot of people's consciousness in the moment. You'll see it when you believe it. If we begin to really work with that understanding and principle, what we'll find is things begin to shift. And this is something I feel that Dr. Dyer very much did. He said, don't die with your music still in you. You and I still have the wonderful benefit of the music and the life of Dr. Wayne Dyer, I would encourage you to take some time in your life to really immerse yourself in some of the principles and ideas that he himself was sharing and lived and shared with the world. And you will find that your life becomes a symphony when you allow that energy of creativity, of spirit, of the truth of your true nature to come forth. There's so much more music that I have not been able to cover today that Dr. Dyer brought into the world and expressed. So I encourage you to take some time. We could do months and years of working with some of the very ideas and principles that he shared in this world, some of the music of these spiritual light, uh, the, this spiritual light. I just wanted to do a, a, a touch and a tribute to someone who has made a powerful impact in my life, and I want to share with you that it's another wonderful time to go back and relook at some of the gifts that he's brought into this world. Let's do that and let's move into our meditation time. So let's take a deep breath. Breathe into the heart space. Move into that place of stillness 
where we are most open and receptive to knowing and feeling and experiencing ourselves as the heart, as the hands, as the light of spirit, and be open to allowing the music of spirit, of our true unique nature, to be expressed in just the right and perfect way, to be open to that inspiration and just as Dr. Dyer was open to hearing the wisdom of spirit and to expressing that through his life, we have the possibilities of hearing, of knowing, and to sharing our light with those in our lives And we see the ripple effects of sharing that love, the compassion, the caring, and the willingness to transform how we show up in our relationships, in our work, in our play. Thank you, Blessed Spirit, for the essence and light that we have and that we are. And thank you for the gift of this great teacher of teachers, Dr. Dyer, and the ripples of good that his life and his teachings are helping to transform the world. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Take a nice deep breath. Let your awareness be in this room, this time, this place, and being present fully here and now. And so it is.